Recently, I had the pleasure of learning how to wire a standalone ECU. This is my attempt at making the video I wish I had to teach me how to do it. Hopefully you find it useful. I sure do love homemade spaghetti. First of all, let me clarify. I am far from an expert on standalone ECUs or engine wiring. That's why when I found this 06R1 engine on Facebook Marketplace, I was very excited to see that it had all the bits going with it to make it a fully functional running engine. Unfortunately, fate had another thing in mind for me because very shortly after purchasing this engine, my car was broken into and somebody decided that a milk crate full of a bunch of old wiring looked incredibly valuable. So that left me here with what essentially isn't much more than just a block of aluminum. After a short time of being appalled by the prices of parts on eBay, I got to thinking, how hard can it be to just slap a standalone ECU on this thing? So then I took a look at the prices of standalone ECUs and went straight back to eBay. But then, after many long nights of research, I came across something that changed everything. An ECU so affordable that, well, I could afford it. So. Without further delay, let me introduce you to Speedwino, or in my case, the Speedwino Ocelot. Now the OG Speedwino is quite a bit more DIY than this. It requires physically soldering components onto a board and then mating it with an Arduino to be the brain of the operation. The Ocelot is a pre-assembled board which has a built-in Arduino chip a very nice sealed automotive connector, and it all packages up in a compact aluminum case. There are also quite a few other varieties of Speedwino out there, everything up to the 8-channel drop bear. Basically, if you're looking for an ECU that doesn't quite literally cost more than any car I own, I would very strongly consider Speedwino. The Ocelot with the case and the connector kit set me back $232, a price which I find quite the opposite of appalling. In any case, with Speedwino in hand, it's time to actually make the spaghetti that attaches this thing to my engine. And hopefully by now you've also purchased your own Speedwino and can follow along from home. I will do my best to break things down as much as possible, so if you are a noob, hopefully you have minimal confusion. And on a side note, if you are not using a Speedwino, but another form of standalone ECU, all that I'm about to show you is probably very close to identical regardless of your engine management system. I was lucky enough to still have the sub-harnesses attached to my engine, so here I am just cutting off the OEM connector and replacing it with a Deutsch-style connector. This isn't really necessary, as I could just splice directly into the sub-harnesses, but it's just going to make my life a lot easier to have connectors here. Before we start actually connecting wires together, we're going to have to grasp a basic understanding of what wires connect where. There are going to be a few resources that you're going to want to use, or in some cases find, which are going to help you gain this understanding. Firstly, since this is a Speedwino install, you're going to want to familiarize yourself with the Speedwino manual. This should give you a good general idea of what you're doing, and is a good first place to look if you're stuck anywhere, as the things in the manual are going to relate very directly to Speedwino. Next, you're going to need the pinout for your specific ECU. This is pretty self-explanatory, what pin is what, and I'd recommend printing this out if you can, because obviously you're going to be referring to this very frequently. Also, on the subject of ECU pinouts, if you can find an OEM pinout for your OEM ECU, it's going to make your life immensely easier. Next, you're probably going to want the OEM wiring diagram. Now, if you can't find one, 
In most cases, it probably is technically possible to do this without it, but especially if you're new to wiring in general, it's pretty essential to have one of these. They can be a bit daunting to look at at first, but once you break it down into the small parts that you're actually concerned with, they're really not too bad. I will leave links for all these things in the description, just in case you also happen to be installing a Speedwino Ocelot onto a Yamaha R1. All right, at long last, it is finally time to actually start wiring, and we will start with the ignition. Ignition wiring is one area that can vary quite dramatically engine to engine, depending on if the engine has a distributor or is coil on plug or wasted spark. I will cover the wiring for my system, which has a separate ignition module with what are referred to as dumb coils. Most of the other systems are covered pretty well on the Speedwino manual. So how does my ignition system work? Well, as mentioned before, it uses what are called dumb coils. Dumb coils are basically just a simple coil with no igniter. You can tell it's a dumb coil because it only has two wires connecting to it, a positive and a negative. Since my engine is a four cylinder with fully sequential ignition, I have four of them. Like many motorcycles, the stock Yamaha ECU had built-in igniters. Unfortunately for me, the Ocelot does not. Instead, it is designed to send a 5 volt signal to an ignition module, which then fires the coil. This is where the quad spark comes in. As the name suggests, the quad spark is a 4 channel ignition module. So basically, you run your wires from your ECU to the quad spark, and then the quad spark to the coils. There's also 4 ground wires from the quad spark that need to be grounded. You're also going to need switched 12 volt power to your coils, so run all the positives of your coils to a fuse in your fuse box. Of course, if you're not wiring from scratch, those wires should already be in place. One thing to keep in mind is Speedwino will always fire igniter 1, 2, 3, 4. So depending on your firing order, you will need to compensate for that in your wiring. Basically, don't wire them in cylinder order, but in firing order. Okay, now that we have wired our ignition system, let's turn our attention to the injectors. First, the injectors will also need a switched 12 volt power source. Again, this should come from your fuse box. All that's left after this is to run each individual injector wire from your ECU to your injectors. This should also be done in firing order rather than cylinder order if you plan on doing fully sequential injection. Now that we have fuel and spark, let's turn our attention to sensors. And we will start with the most important sensors in your engine, the camshaft and or crankshaft position sensors. Now these sensors usually come in two varieties. Firstly, there's the VR sensor or variable reluctance sensor, and secondly, there's the Hall effect sensor. You can tell the two apart because VR sensors are almost always two wire sensors, and Hall effect sensors always have three wires. I was lucky enough to have both types of sensor on my engine, a VR sensor for the crankshaft and a Hall effect sensor for the camshaft. Let's start with the VR sensor. Firstly, one of the wires from the VR sensor will need to connect to either primary trigger or secondary trigger on your Speedwino. Primary trigger is for your crankshaft position sensor, and secondary trigger is for your camshaft position sensor. At least, typically, that's the case. There are a lot of different trigger setups out there. The other wire from the VR sensor will connect either to primary trigger VR only or secondary trigger VR only. Since my VR sensor is for my crankshaft, I will be connecting one wire to primary trigger and the other wire to primary trigger VR only. You may need to experiment with swapping your VR sensor wires in order to get your ECU to read the signal properly. Keep in mind, if you are using a VR sensor, you will need to attach a VR conditioner to your Speedwino and use the correct jumper settings to route the signal through the VR conditioner. Now let's talk about Hall Effect sensors. As mentioned before, the Hall Effect sensor has three wires. One of these wires is a signal wire, which will go to either primary or secondary trigger, depending on whether it is a crank sensor or a cam sensor. The next wire is a 5 volt reference wire. This wire is supplied with 5 volts from the ECU and will go to your 5 volt pin. The last wire is the sensor ground and should be grounded directly to your ECU. 
Quick note about grounding. The Ocelot has five grounding pins. These are all the same and you can ground sensors to any of them. Just make sure you leave at least two of them to ground your ECU to battery negative. Other three wire sensors, such as a map sensor or throttle position sensor, are wired exactly the same as the Hall Effect sensor. So they will be wired to the five volt pin and will be wired to ground, but of course have their own unique signal wire. In the case of the throttle position sensor, this has its own unique pin on the ocelot, but in the case of a map sensor, if you are using an external map sensor, then you would use one of the spare input pins. Let's talk about temperature sensors. These are usually two wire sensors and are really quite simple. First, each sensor needs to be grounded to the ECU, and secondly, each sensor needs to be wired to their respective input pin on the ECU. Last but not least, in terms of sensors, we will need to wire our wideband O2 sensor and controller. I am using the 14.7 Spartan 3 Lite V2 wideband controller and the Bosch LSU 4.9 wideband O2 sensor. First, the wideband controller is going to need switched 12 volt power. It's very important this is switched and not straight from the battery because if it is not switched, your O2 sensor heater will remain on even after you switch your vehicle off. Next, there are two different ground wires. First, there's the ground wire for the wideband controller electronics. This should be grounded directly to your ECU. Next, there's a separate ground wire for the O2 sensor heater. This should be grounded wherever your wiring harness grounds, so probably to your engine block or something. Lastly, the signal wire from your controller will need to be wired to the appropriate pin on your ECU. On the Ocelot, that pin is labeled exhaust gas sensor. All right, we are almost there. The last thing we need to cover is low current outputs. If you're not familiar, the purpose of these is to use a relay to control something like a fuel pump or a radiator fan. The reason a relay is used is because the ECU itself is not able to switch any sort of high amperage. So instead of switching a pump or a fan on directly, it uses a very low current to trigger a relay, which is then able to switch a much higher amperage, therefore switching on your pump or fan or whatever. So how does this all get wired? Well, there are four pins pins on a standard relay, 30, 85, 86, and 87. Firstly, let's go over 85 and 86. These are the low current terminals which are used to switch the relay to connect the high current terminals. 86 needs to connect to 12 volts positive, and 85 needs to connect to ground. With some relays, this is interchangeable. However, many relays use a diode to protect your ECU, and these relays need to be wired correctly which is 86 positive, 85 negative. All the low current outputs on the ECU are what's called ground switching. This means they connect any given low current output pin to ground. Since 85 is ground, we will connect the 85 pin on the relay to the low current output on the computer. The computer will then act as a switch connecting that 85 pin to ground. The 86 pin will then connect to the 12 volt power source. Speaking of 12 volts, the main 12 volt supply will go to pin 30 on the relay. You can just tee off this larger wire in order to supply the 86 pin with 12 volts, as I just mentioned. Pin 87 of the relay can now be wired to the positive of whatever high current device you're trying to power. The negative of the device can then be appropriately grounded, and in our example, now our computer has full control over our fan. Of course, if you're not wiring from scratch and are just wiring an ECU into an existing wiring harness, all this wiring should already exist. All you need to do, in that case, is connect 85 from the relay to the appropriate pin on your ECU. On the Ocelot pinout, all of these gray pins are low current outputs. Some of them are already assigned to things like fuel pump or fans, but can be repurposed if needed. While we are looking at the pinout, I should probably touch on getting power to the ECU. This is pretty self-explanatory. Simply run switched 12 volt, aka keyed 12 volt, to the keyed 12 volt pin here, 
There's also a unswitched 12 volt pin, which will receive unswitched 12 volt power. And as I mentioned before, two of the ground pins on the ECU should be dedicated to grounding your ECU. Some people say you should ground your ECU directly to battery negative, however this does go against star point grounding. If you're interested, look it up and decide for yourself. So, that's pretty much it. You have wired your standalone ECU and are ready to start your engine. Well, you're quite a long ways from starting your engine, but I will be making a future video on the rest of the process, which should be out quite soon, hopefully. I'm sure you'll still have questions after watching this video, as it's almost impossible to cover every little detail and keep the video any sort of reasonable length. So be sure to ask your questions in the comments, and I will do my best to answer as best I can. Also, if you are knowledgeable in this area, feel free to correct anything. As I mentioned before, I am still somewhat of a noob in this area. Also, this little wiring project is part of a very cool homemade motorcycle powered car project I'm working on. So if that sounds interesting, make sure to subscribe and follow along. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, enjoy your spaghetti.